Yara Allen. And I'm Cheryl Azale. And so we just came to, um, I know you've been probably sitting for a little bit. And so we're going to sing a song. Normally when we are in front of a large group of people, we see a choir. And we call it the Justice Jump Off Choir. So can we call this the New York Justice Jump Off Choir? Okay. And normally what I would do is like take um, a survey in the room and ask, where are the sopranos? Where are the altos? Where are the tenors? <laughs> Got you. Bass baritone? Where are our beloved I don't knows? And it never fails that some of the same people raise their hands again. It's okay, because none of that matters tonight. Tonight, we're going to sing what we're singing. And down south, we call it jump in and hang on. Amen. But the thing that we do is we stand together to sing. And I understand if some of you can't, but I'm going to ask you to stand because there was something that my grandmother, my maternal grandmother used to say when we would sing, girl, bring it from your toes. Now, if you're singing, that's a little difficult to do because it, you know, can't quite flow the way it would if you were to stand. And when I, I remember my grandmother, I remember a strong, silent, uh, but not, not silent to the point that she didn't speak out against injustice. And she commanded respect. And I remember that she used to say, just walk around the house singing, just so glad I'm here. So glad I'm here. So glad I'm here in Jesus' name. So now what the movement did was we borrowed from our ancestors. And they trusted us with those songs that brought them over. And we kind of tweaked the words just a little bit. And I don't think that they would mind, because this is their movement too. And we sing, so glad I'm here, so glad I'm here, so glad I'm here in freedom's name. So glad I'm here. So we're going to get to a part where we pick it up, and that's going to be your cue to come in with this burst of amazing harmony that I've heard about. So glad I'm here. So, so glad I'm here. So, so glad I'm here in freedom's name. Hallelujah. So glad. Freedom's, freedom's name. Oh, faith brought me here. Trusted and faith, it brought me here. Oh, faith brought me here. 
in freedoms in free dumb's name okay justice jump off choir one more time for Yara Allen and Cheryl Uzzell. And we thank the ancestors for entrusting us with those songs. I have one prayer that I want to pray tonight if you bow your heads with me. Lord, I just want to thank you. Amen. 
Now, the reason I said that prayer like that is because we've been trying to get here <laughs> since 3.30. And Reverend Livingston, who's the interim senior minister, and Reverend Dr. Forbes, Pastor Emeritus, and Dr. Fully Love, professor of the New School, and Dr. Fred Davis and others. Somebody in here knows how to pray. They asked me, did I want an introduction? I said, nope. First of all, this is my New York family, so I feel right at home. And second of all, I just want to thank the Lord for being here. About 425, we were told that the instrumentation on the plane went out. And um, they couldn't land at LaGuardia because they had no instrumentation to measure the runway. And it was in the rain and they started flying all over the ocean, which I knew that meant somebody was dumping some gas or something. And then finally they told us they would land us at JFK because they had a longer airstrip that didn't need, they didn't need to measure, could, they could just roll till they stopped. And, uh, and then, and you know, think about that, raining, they didn't know exactly what was going on in terms of how to stop. And then we got on the plane and we, as we landed, we saw all these fire trucks coming out. Am I right? They told the travel, 10 of us travel. And uh, then they kept us on the plane, wouldn't let us off. Then we couldn't pull up to the gate because they couldn't move the plane anymore. Then they had to get the buses. And then they had to bring the um, piece that rises up so I could walk off. So tonight, with no just no pretense at all, Lord, I just want to thank you. Hallelujah. Stolen hands, stolen lands from 1619 to a just future, learning from the sins of the past so that we might embrace a better future. As we're gathered here tonight to mark and to mourn that 400 years ago, race-based chattel slavery began, and with its beginning, it birthed an even deeper form of systematic, systemic racism that had already existed in the way our native and indigenous brothers and sisters had faced, first, our First Nation people, who were here when Columbus, Columbus said he discovered something. I want to lift a text from the first book of the Bible, from the Genesis account which precedes the Exodus. In the 15th chapter of the first book of Scripture we read, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs, and they shall be slaves there and they shall be oppressed for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. Hebrews 11, 23 says, Moses, when born in slavery, was hid for three months because he was a proper child. And then the 24th verse says, Moses, refused to become the son of Pharaoh and he chose rather to suffer 
with the affliction, the affliction shall suffer affliction with his people and the people of God rather to enjoy or accept sin for a little while. Though the haughty purveyors of injustice have always laid claim to absolute authority and maintain the pretense of the permanence of systemic racism, the Bible is clear that no lie can live forever. And after four centuries of oppression, a nation must be judged, must be. As in a court of law, the sins must be laid out for all to see and examine them for what they are. A God who is just promises such judgment. Not that the nation may be condemned, but so that we may have the opportunity in the light of justice to decide who we want to be. And America is at a deciding time right now. 400 years is the appointed time for a reckoning, Dr. Forbes. And my brothers and sisters, we have seven sins, or if I might be like the writer of Proverbs, six sins, yea, seven, that we must reckon with if we are to take seriously the systemic racism we have inherited born out of the system of slavery. If indeed this is our long awaited day in court, then let the charges be read. All seven counts. Your Honor, The United States stands accused today of bad biology, sick sociology, political pathology, evil economics, corruptible courts, militia madness, and heretical ontology. These are the seven sins that undergirded the system of slavery. And to name our sins is to tell the story of how we got here, but also, like the Bible says of Moses, it is to say we refuse to go along with sin even for a little while. Judgment is also an opportunity to ask honestly whether we're going to repent and rebirth America again. 400 years ago, a Dutch warship, the White Lion, sailing under a Dutch flag but with an English captain and crew, sailed from the Netherlands as privateers licensed by their governments to plunder Spanish vessels. They robbed a Portuguese slaver of roughly 60 of its human cargo, Angolans from West Africa. The privateer sailed the twice stolen Africans to the English colony at Jamestown, Virginia. There, reported local leader John Rolfe, the White Lion traded the settlers 20 and odd Africans in exchange for food and provision. The Africans who disembarked at Jamestown landed among colonists who had no cause to regard themselves as white. The Virginia colony had defined at that time neither slavery nor race that summer day in 1619. 
The Africans that arrived on the white lion may not have been ordinary indentured servants, but they did not fold neatly into an existing institution. Most Europeans in Virginia arrived as indentured servants, bound for seven years, whereupon the colony granted them a plot of land. If the legal status of the Africans as they clambered from the ship that day remained uncertain, their color was not yet laden with the meanings of race that slavery would inscribe upon the bodies of their descendants. Race was not yet necessary. Bad biology wasn't yet needed to explain a system that would call some people black. In Jamestown in the early 17th century, unfree labor was both black and white and had yet to be cleaved by color and clotted into the peculiar institution of slavery. But the energy and ingenuity of that bound workforce represented the very survival of the English colony when its prospects seemed dim. In the first few decades, the African and European servants did not see each other decisively different. They no doubt saw color, as so many today claim not to, but those hues did not define the power to subdue, humiliate, and destroy children of many colors bore witness to the array of relationships these human beings, black and white people, living and working together, falling in love, starting families, having children, and regardless of color, held in servitude and subject to the master's whip. The Virginia colonies muster in 1621 lists 23 Africans and a single Indian all of them counted merely not as slaves, but as servants. But then we read on. The life of one of the Angolans, a servant named Antonio, traces the evolution of racial identity in colonial Virginia. In 1635, 17 years later, well, 16 years later, he completed his indentured and settled on a plot of land on the eastern shore. Johnson married a woman of African descent, obtaining her freedom as well from indentured servitude, and later bought other African indentured servants as laborers. The couple lived as Anthony and Mary Johnson. They reared four children, and by 1650, they owned a 250-acre farm. But when Anthony Johnson died in 1677, he tried to leave, he had tried to leave his land to his children. But by then, the colonial regime granted his farm to a white settler. And the judge ruled that Johnson was not a citizen of the colony because of his color. Sick sociology was now taking its root in this land. Still, the law and custom vacillated for decades on the status of African servants in colonial Virginia. In 1640, a black servant named John Pooch fled his bondage, accompanied by two white servants, when the authorities caught and tried them for the theft of themselves. That was the trial. They were tried for the theft of themselves. The white men had their terms of indentured servants lengthened for several years, but the courts ordered John Punch, the black man, to serve his master for the rest of his natural life, here and elsewhere. That court's decision reveals that Punch's servitude had not been regarded as permanent, let alone hereditary. But now, bad biology, sick sociology, Evil economics and corrupt uh, corruptible courts were developing to justify a political pathology. The colony had begun to force black servants into lifelong service of race-based chattel slavery, all for evil economics that says as long as you make the money, the means justifies the end. In 1661, the Virginia legislature reversed 
centuries of common law in a measure that makes it clear that racialized and hereditary bondage was their intent. In English common law, the status of a child followed the child's father. But in Virginia, the new law ruled a child's status would henceforth follow the child's mother. Virginia's population included many persons whose skins came in various shades of brown, their fathers free and white, and therefore his children were free, even though not visibly white. This was overturned and a racialized order of hereditary bondage clearly required that that structure, that structure and more be put in place. In the first years of the involuntary importation of African sermon, sermon, Christianity served as a pretext for bringing them here. Christianity, or a false form of Christianity. It was said that English civilization could elevate their souls. But if the elevation worked and the Africans accepted the faith, that raised the question of their legal status, for there had been the doctrine of origins pushed by the church, said that wherever white men basically conquered, it was there and all others were their servants. The acceptance of Christian baptism was a powerful symbol to white Virginians who saw it as crucial evidence of the development of civility and rationality. Since these qualities were seen in, as incompatible with slave status, conversion sometimes brought manumission or at least some degree of greater personal freedom. And that left open the question as to whether their baptism altered the African's legal status. Well, that, was a, that was a serious, serious theological wrestling. If we baptize them, does this baptism in any way change their status as slaves? The colonial legislature resolved the issue. The legislature resolved the issue by act number three. Whereas some doubts have risen whether children that are slaves by birth and by the charity and piety of their owners may be partakers of the blessed sacrament of baptism and should by virtue of their baptism be made free, it is enacted and declared by this grand assembly and the authority thereof that confirming, conferring of baptism does not alter the condition of the person as to his bondage or freedom. The legislature overrode what Christ had said. And what Paul had said about Christ, to be in Christ is to be free, and to be free indeed. Here we see this political pathology mixing with a heretical ontology that basically says this is the way God ordered things. The le this legislation added that slave owners, thus freed from the worry that propagating the gospel among the enslaved would sacrifice their workforce could now be even better advocates of the faith by admitting that enslaved, by admitting enslaved children to the sacrament of baptism, secure in the faith that these children and their children after them would be forever enslaved. In other words, we can make them Christian now because Christian is not going to make them free according to our law. This heretical ontology became the basis of what my brother Jonathan Wilson Hargrove, who happens to be white, calls slaveholder religion. As a matter of faith, white Christians came to believe that the economic and political systems they were building on the stolen labor and stolen land was God's work. And that to be Christian, it really it was to be white. And to be baptized Christian as a slave was to make your soul white, but to still keep your black body in bondage. Wilson Hartgrove writes, by giving its God's blessing, 
They aim to make it a sin to oppose slavery and to oppose their political pathology. But they had not converted everyone in the Virginia colony to this heretical ontology. In 1676 and 1677, Virginia settlers rebelled against the colonial government, led by a white man, Nathaniel Bacon. His ragtag army was drawn from Virginians of all socioeconomic classes and shades of, of color, first attacking the nearby Indian nations to take their land, which is a problematic part of the Bacon's Rebellion. But Bacon's band ran Governor William Berkeley from Jamestown and burned the capital. And they, this was a black and white army, militia. Having forced the government to flee to the ships in the harbor and then back to England, Bacon's forces, black and white, ruled the colony. It took the English military several years to win back royal control of the Virginia colony. Black and white servants had long conjoined and conspired, but this was a new and dangerous level of cooperation. Across the color line, Militia madness would become a necessary component then of systematic racism in America. We cannot allow them to fight together. And we cannot let them work together. Later on, this militia madness would also be the basis of the Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment was really put into the Constitution to ensure that white men would be able to raise militias against slave rebellion. But it took more than English soldiers to rebuild the hierarchical society that Bacon had tried to overthrow. White supremacy provided the ideology necessary to undo his dangerous coalition. It flourished a rationale for the unfolding robbery of racialized and hereditary slavery. Legal structures now, after this Bacon rebe Rebellion, legal structures around color and status changed sharply. After this rebellion, race became white supremacist citadel. Racial disparities, the indelible mark of its deepest violence. The Virginia Slave Code of 1705 fully consolidated the system of racial and hereditary bondage, bad biology, sick sociology, political pathology, evil economic, militia madness, and heretical ontology were all written into law, sick sociology. These people cannot exist together. Bad biologists, some folk are made like this. Uh, patholo political pathology, when politics is used to enforce and, 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 and make real the promises of evil. Evil economics, long as the end results in wealth for the oppressor, the means does not matter. Militia, military, we got to keep our guns because we might have, to, might have to kill some of these folks if they start organizing and rebelling. And heretical ontology, God meant it this way. Americans tend to believe that race is something real, an undeniable assignment by the natural world. Racism, we assume, stems from this bleak but biological condition. Tanisha Coates explains that this delusion renders white supremacy as the innocent daughter of Mother Nature. This confusion leads many to bemoan the death machine of the Atlantic slave trade and lament the trail of tears in the same way that we mourn a tornado without a twinge of remorse. It was just supposed to happen. But Coates reminds us Race is the child of racism and not the father. The father of racism is the need to justify the brutal and hereditary bondage of chattel slavery. It is far less convenient and uplifting for white Americans to acknowledge that the reason for the racial caste system was not bad white people's personal animosity toward the Africans as opposed to good white people's opposition to slavery. The reason was staple crop, agriculture, tobacco, rice, sugar, coffee, and cotton. 
in slave labor was the oil of the 18th and 19th century. As Ibram Kendi has argued so convincingly, racism isn't an idea that led to a system of oppression, no. It is instead a story we told ourselves to explain why the use and abuse of black people was good, just, and even righteous. Racism is the way this country, far too many, soothe their consciousness about chattel slavery. If Virginia colonial elites invented race to defend their property and privilege, then why can't we shine the light of truth today and make it go away? The reason the late historian Ira Berlin instructs us is that race is a particular kind of social construction. It has these, and, for, and I say, has these seven undergirding foundations that makes race not merely a political problem, but a religious problem. For some people, race is their ultimate concern. <laughs> and race is bound up bad biologists, sick sociology, evil economics, corruptible courts, heretical ontology. Race has lumbered and lurched forward through time with all the weight of the past as its power driver. History furnishes us no do-overs, so race keeps reconstructing itself refitting the old ship for new journeys, as Tim Tyson says. Race does not hang there timeless as an unchanging fact. It is not an inherent trait that we possess. Instead, race is a relationship that occurs and reoccurs from people, and we keep teaching it to succeeding generations. Without the politics of domination, without our terrifying history, what we call race might become only culture and hardly calls for hostility. You know, I'm not black, white, and Tuscaroan by any detectable biology. Instead, these were my people, and they remain so because I walk through the world with them, and they with me, my Tuscaroan ancestors, my white ancestors, my black ancestors, I walk through the world with them. I walk through the world with their songs, their stories, their food ways, their folk ways. All of that rides comfortably kind of in my pocket. And still others, like my faith traditions, like my family's love, like the aspiration for justice and democracy, that certain visions of American history harbored within me give me hope. But other artifacts that are in me, like the institutions all around me that white supremacy built in its own image and buttressed to preserve itself, they weigh like a thick, invisible chain around my neck and some days render me paralyzed almost by despair. White supremacy has a history too, bad biologists, sick sociology, evil economics, corruptible courts, political pathology, militia madness, and heretical ontology. These seven sins have conspired to prop up a system that has robbed black Americans throughout the history of this nation and robs black Americans to this day and robs America. These seven sins. White supremacy is the social structure that became both the pillar and the signpost of these evil arrangements. It is a political program devoted to white domination that resides in our state houses and in our White House, and it, just, it didn't just get there. White supremacy is the unconscious array of assumptions of inferiority and superiority that we carry in our heads, whatever their hue. But let us be clear. White supremacy is as poisonous to white people as it is to people of color. I thought I might ought to say that. Huh? White supremacy is not just anti-black, it's anti-democracy.
It's anti-humanity. It's anti-truth. It's anti-love. Its weaponized legacy, one writer says, can transform this blue-green jewel that we inhabit into a cold and empty stone spinning in space. White supremacy had a beginning, and it will have an end. have an end either in that eternal silence or it will have an end when we decide that the judgments of God are just and it's time to end it. God's judgments are just but they're not always pretty. Our long delayed day of reckoning has come and truth be told we are both the accused and the jury, America, and we must decide our own fate in the light of the truth that justice reveals. And if we are to be honest about our past, we cannot overlook how the idea of liberty progressed alongside the racist ideas that were used to justify the murderous sin of chattel slavery. America was hardly unique in its practice of enslavement. But what is unique about the plantation economy that emerged in Eastern Virginia four centuries ago was neither its violence nor its devaluation of human lives. That was not what was unique. What was unique was its dual claim. Its dual claim that every human being has inherent rights while some are damned to perpetual servitude. They are not even human. They are three-fifths. They are chattel. They are animals, they are property. And simply because of the color of their sin, racism was the only thing that could reconcile America's excruciating contradictions and hypocrisy. You had to come up with race as a way to justify the system of slavery. Democratic dreams and systemic racism are our legacy both, Hero heroism and hypocrisy are, are tangled in our birthright. Visions of universal love and heresies of slaveholder religion walk hand in hand throughout our history. It is increasingly clear, however, that democracy cannot endure if we don't dismantle systemic racism. God's judgments are not always just about assigning fault. God wants to illuminate reality. And when we review the record on all seven charges, this much is clear. White supremacy is not human nature. Human freedom is a merciless fact. As James Baldwin says, we made the world we're living in, and we have to make it over again. The legacy of America's fledgling democracy, the question of whether we have anything more than a trillion tons of plastic to offer the world, all these matters are bound up in our capacity to change. We can stop believing that we or anybody else is white. <laughs> we can stop believing in supremacy, or we can perish together as equals in the truly perfect equality of planetary destruction, which is the ultimate end of systemic racism born out of slavery. <laughs> Ultimately, for America, Dr. Forbes, God's judgment is today, 400 years later, I set before you life and death. Choose life. You'll put away racism. Choose death, and it will destroy you. If we are to choose life in the light of the judgment of God, it will mean understanding that the moral crisis we see is not a new thing, and it did not start with Trump. Now, I did not say he wasn't a moral crisis. I just said it did not start. <laughs> What we see today is an extension 
of the seven sins that have stained our history. The political pathology that undergirded slavery is still alive in the constant assault on democracy we are witnessing. 23 states since 2010, six years before Trump was running anywhere, have passed racist voter suppression laws, racist gerrymandering laws. That is political pathology. Huh? Mitch McConnell and his enablers in the Congress long before Trump ever came on the scene refused to restore the Voting Rights Act after the Supreme Court gutted Section 5 in 2013. That's the result of political pathology and corruptible courts. We must be clear, the sins of our past are still with us. 25 states have passed laws that preempt cities. Most of them are large black cities from adopting their own local minimum wages. That's political pathology and evil economics. 6.1 million people who have been disfranchised due to felony convictions, including one in every 13 adults. That is a form of sick sociology and political pathology. We see bad biology and sick sociology in the demonizing of some immigrants as illegal aliens, while many refuse to acknowledge that Texas, Mexico, California were taking from the Mexican people in the Mexican-American War. That's bad biology, that's sick sociology, and that's political pathology. Look at how our legacy of evil economics continues. Undocumented immigrants contributed $5 trillion to the U.S. economy over the last 10 years, and they paid $13 billion in Social Security that they will not be able to receive. That's a form of evil economics. Resegregation of our public schools is rooted in sick sociology and political pathology. All these years after Brown, resegregation is happening faster than it did in the 1970s. And it's not just the resegregation of, of, of bodies, it's the resegregation of budgets and books and bodies and brain power. Mass incarceration represents the remnant of sick sociology and political pathology. When you make prisons private to make money, this is the remnant of the evil economics that undergirded slavery. When in the book entitled The Crucified God, I believe it's the Christian, no, that was Moltmann, The Incarcerated God. The book entitled The Incarcerated God, someone was asked, why are you all right with more money going into prisons than going into school? And somebody said, oh, that's an easy question because we can't live like we want to live with some people around us, so we create ghettos but the ghettos fill up and we have to have somewhere to put people so we can keep more people in the ghettos so that they're not around us so that we can live like we want to live. That is the same sick sociology and bad biology that undergirded slavery. Indigenous people and tribes, huh? when corporations are allowed to drill on sacred lands and reservations and when they will bring casinos on to those reservations, but will not bring housing and schools on those reservations. That, that, that is the representation of the remnants of the same sick sociology and political pathology and evil economics that helped to undergird slavery. When we look at poverty, we see the remnants of the same things that undergirded slavery. And we see how we gave trillions of dollars to bail out crooks on Wall Street and trillions in tax cuts to the wealthy and trillions going into a war economy. But we refuse to address the fact that 140 million people live in poverty and low wealth. 39 million children, 21 million seniors, 65 million men, 74 million women, 26 million black people, 38 million Latino people, 8 million Asian people, and 66 million white people. To have a system that would reward the crooks and say that banks are too big to fail, but then we allow people to fall and fail in poverty and low wealth is nothing but evil economics. <laughs> Half of our children in poverty and low wealth, the vast majority of people of color but in the raw numbers, white women and white people are more poor and low wealth than any other demographic. 
400 years after slavery, the remnants of evil economics isn't just hurting black people. It's hurting and killing us all because racism is like cancer. It spreads. When working people, 62 million people work every day for less than a living wage, while CEOs make 300 times the average worker. That's a form of evil economics, the same kind that helped to undergird. That's a remnant. Think about it. It took black people 400 years to get from zero to 725. That's the minimum wage in most places, 725. Zero to 725. And yet we powerful forces today still fight living wages when we know that a federal $15 minimum wage, if it was enacted immediately, would raise the pay of 49 million workers by $328 billion a year, and that money would go directly back into the economy, building up our nation. What hinders us? The same kind of political pathology and the same remnants of the kind of evil economics that undergirded slavery. The Mailman School of Public Policy, Public Health says 250 people die each day from poverty, 684 people a day. Seven people died from vaping and we called it a national emergency. <laughs> 600 poor people die every day because we racialize poverty. We made folk think it's something over there just affecting black folk and brown folk when the reality is affecting everybody. This, these, the unwillingness to deal with these issues are the remnants of the same political pathology and evil economics that undergirded slavery. A black woman with a doctorate degree in America today has a higher rate of infant mortality and maternal morbidity than a white woman with a high school degree. We have a public health system that still carries some bad biology within it. When black women are four times more likely to die in childbirth today. In the 13 former Confederate states that believed in holding their slaves, there are 52 million people are poor and low income. One third of all the poor people in this country live in the South. The number of poor whites in those states is more than a third of all the poor whites in this country. And the same politicians that use race to divide, once they get elected through racist voter suppression, they use their power to block living wages, health care that affects everybody, and mostly whites around this country. More blacks in terms of percentage. The, how can they do that unless they are using the remnants of a political pathology and evil economics and a sick sociology that undergirded slavery. You know, if we were repeal the Trump tax cuts and establish fair taxes on the wealthy, we could generate $886 billion a year to go into roads and schools and health care. Just an annual wealth tax on the 75,000 wealthiest households could generate $275 billion a year, more than enough to put 2.5 million people to work fixing our infrastructure. Why can't we do that? The remnants of evil economics, the remnants of a political pathology. And then we can't overlook this militia and military madness that was necessary to put down Bacon's rebellion. Did you know in 2018, just one company, Boeing, received $27 billion in military contracts? Just one contract to one military com uh, contracting company could have paid for Medicaid expansion in 14 states that didn't expand. Hmm? Well, just one. Why don't we do that? Why are we so deeply committed to a military that primarily is only engaging in wars against color, people of color? It traces back to this militia and military madness, this evil economics that undergirded slavery. Why is it that we're so bound by the gun lust of the NRA? It grows out of the same militia madness that was a part of the early foundings of this country. And some say, well, the Bible says the poor will be with you always. And in that, we see the remnants of slaveholder religion, heretical ontology. When we refuse to deal with the, the ecological death, 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 uh, destruction, Something is pathologically wrong. 
when you know your planet is being destroyed and your children will suffer, but for money, you refuse to address it. That's a sickness. When you would rather have the wealth now and the greed now than life for your children, children, that is a sick form of pathological politics and evil economics. Four million people in this nation can buy unleaded gas but can't buy unleaded water every day and we could fix it. The ecological devastation from our inner cities to where I'm headed tomorrow, Cancer Alley in Louisiana. Cancer Alley is where former plantations have become chemical plants that, that poison the sons and daughters of the formerly enslaved and the sharecroppers alike and the poor white folk that stand around them. The same lands that were once plantation now is making money leasing that land to chemical companies that are poisoning black, brown, and white people. That it, the existence of that cancer alley reveals the remnants of political pathology, evil economics, and sick sociology. When 400 years after slavery, 68% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant, the distance within which the maximum effects of smokestacks, fume, plumes are expected to occur, the sins of our past are still with us. African Americans are 79% more likely than whites to live where industrial pollution poses the greatest health danger and they are overrepresented in populations who live within three mile radius of the nation's 1,388 Superfund sites. Those are sites that were so poisoned that they had to be designated Superfund to be cleaned up. And when finally we see this religious nationalism run amok, white evangelicals of so-called Christian right, Christian nationalism, talking about their religious liberty while saying nothing, about the injustices of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, and the war con con economy, what we are seeing even now is the remnants of the same heretical ontology that justified the slave system. God meant it this way, and it is a damnable lie from the very pit of hell itself. When we see all of this in the light of God's justice and judgment, when our past and our presence are laid bare in the highest court, it is not only clear that the sins of our past are still with us, but it is also becomes clear that we are heirs to a diverse program for restorative justice. From Bacon's rebellion to the abolition struggle to the women's suffrage struggle, to the fight for indigenous people, to the stance against the way Chinese immigrants were treated, the way Frederick Douglass involved himself in that, from to the, to the civil rights movement, the labor movement, the women's movement, Moral Monday movement, poor people's campaign, the fight for 15. There's always been a fight against these seven sins. Somebody has stood up and cried loud against these seven sins. And my friends, 400 years later, if we are to truly mark the four centuries of history that we have gathered here to mourn and to remember, there's only one way to do it. We must have a movement. We cannot have some triumphant celebration that acts as though everything is all right Instead, what we need is a movement that is committed to fighting for the dignity of every human being and saying that we will never give in to the remnants of bad biology, sick sociology, political pathology, evil economics, corruptible courts, militia madness, or heretical ontologies that justify and undergird racism. We will never give in to those realities, not even for a little while. Not even for a little while. That's why Liz is here somewhere. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, 
We're on a 25-state tour entitled We Must Do More. And on June 20 of 2020, we are calling all of you to join us in Washington, D.C. for a mass poor people's assembly and moral march on Washington. Because there comes a time when those who have known slavery and oppression and those who've known history and know the hard trials and tribulation, we must become the cornerstones of a new world. And in this moment, we must rise and fight because we are clear about the seven sins that keep, these th keep trying to hold us back from doing the things we ought to do. In this 400th year, the ancestors of those whose hands once picked cotton must join the hands of Latinos and join the hands of progressive whites and join faith hands and labor hands and Asian hands and native hands and poor hands and wealthy hands and gay hands and straight hands and trans hands and Christian hands and Jewish hands and Muslim hands and Hindu hands and Buddhist hands. And when all these hands get together we can honor our ancestors when all of these hands get together we can revive and rebirth and make sure that the promises of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and equal protection under the law and care for the common good will never be taken away or forfeited for anybody anytime anywhere by 2040 in the United States, white people will be one of many minority groups. This demographic reality is the driving force, my friend, behind attacks on immigrants, voter suppression, and the corporate and foreign influence campaigns of the American life. From the U.S. to the U.K. to Brazil to Russia to China and Israel, a global economy that was built on the sugar and cotton that enslaved people harvested is threatened by a radical democracy of poor people's movement that are coming to fall even in this nation. Nationalist leaders are responding with reactionary populism that appeals to racism and xenophobia, deploying the same divide and conquer tactic that King noted about what happened in the South to keep black and white people from working together. And we must resist what has been resisted in the past. I choose to believe that on this 40th, 400th anniversary that the America which has never been yet may nevertheless still be. Together with people from every race, creed, color, and sexuality, I am committed to working with you all to build a moral fusion coalition in the 21st century. Is there anybody else in here ready to build? We must rise, just like, just like those slaves got up every morning singing up above my head. I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. Just how they got up every morning in the midst of slavery, but with the hope of freedom. We must rise like they did. We must rise together for voting rights. We must rise together for immigration reform. We must rise together for indigenous rights. We must rise together to fight poverty, not the poor. We must rise together for living wages and housing for all and health care for all and clean and affordable water for all. We must rise together for free, diverse, high quality public education for all. We must rise together for tax fairness and an end to wealth inequality. We must rise together to end the new Jim Crow and mass incarceration. We must rise for peace and to end the militarism and the war economy. We must rise together for real domestic security. Jobs, income, housing, education, health care, and water. And we must rise to stand against the seven sins that still trouble the heart of our democracy. Hosea. Oh, my God. Hosea and Mabel Staples in tribute to that prophetic singer Nina Simone told us that being woke is not enough. They sung a song tribute, tribute to Nina Simone and they said it's not the waking, it's the rising. <laughs> It's the grounding of a foot, uncompromising. It's not forging of a lie. It's not the opening of an eye. It's not the waking. 
it's the rising. It's not the shade we should be cast in. It's the light. It's the obstacle that casts it. It's the heat that drives the light. It's the fire that it ignites. It's not the waking. It's the rising. It's not the song. It's the singing. It's the heaven, heaven of the human spirit ringing. It's the bringing of the line. It's the be bearing of the lie. It's not the waking of the ride. Touch your neighbor. Say, neighbor, it's all right to be woke, but you can be woke and still in bed. It's time to rise. The slaves got out of bed. They rose up every morning. Freedom. Oh, freedom. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave, going home with my Lord to be free. It's time to rise, y'all. We got to rise. And then that song said, Nina cried power. Harriet Tubman cried power. Ella Baker cried power. Martin Luther King cried power. Rosa Parks cried power. Rabbi Heschel cried power. It's time for us to cry power. Power over injustice. Power over racism. Power over inequality. Power. We have the power. And I'm reminded of a son of Harlem who used his pen to take on these seven sins. And in the midst of the Harlem labor protest in 1935, this son of Harlem, Langston Hughes, he wrote, for all the dreams that we have dreamed and all the songs that we have sung and all the hopes that we have held and all the flags that we have hung, to the millions who have nothing for their pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, the Indians, the Negroes, me, me, who made America, who sweat in blood, whose faith in the and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain. We must bring back our mighty dream again. So call me in in the ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain from those who have lived like leeches on the people's lives. We must take back our land again. America! has never been America to me, but I swear this oath that America will be. Power! It's time to rise and make this nation what it ought to be.